What's happening, Elevation Nation? We are back for another elevated conversation with a terp, which means that it's an extra elevated conversation today. Zach Joyner, what's up, man? Welcome to Elevation Nation. We're happy to have you. Parker, Sam, uh, good, good to be here. Uh, super excited to dive into the conversation, and I appreciate you guys for having me. Like Parker said, we certainly love when we get to have terps on the podcast because for some reason, we've been having more and more Penn State kids join Elevation Nation to the point where I think they outnumber us. So it's about time we swing the pendulum back in favor of the Terps. So Zach, we are pumped to have you here. And certainly your Maryland roots run a little bit deep that we're going to get into that more than just going to school there. Now you're in a new role. So we'll talk about that in a bit. But this is Elevation Nation. We start every single episode out the same way with something that the Smith School taught us. A little elevator pitch. Who are you, man? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Don't know what's good with the, the Penn State stuff. I don't know whose idea that was, but uh, we'll have to turn that around. We'll have to turn that around here very soon, and hopefully it can start with me. But uh, to introduce myself, name's Zach Joyner. Uh, currently a mid-market enterprise AE account executive at LinkedIn. Uh, I've been at LinkedIn for six years in a number of different roles. have kind of uh, grown up at LinkedIn and uh, – have had the opportunity to accelerate my career here. Uh, as a mid-market enterprise account executive, I work with small, medium-sized uh, b- businesses around their human capital strategy. So what that falls into typically is going to be recruiting, uh, e- elevating uh, companies' workforce through upskilling, and then additionally uh, supporting them in their brand awareness strategy on LinkedIn. Uh, Outside of LinkedIn, you could find me on the tennis court. Uh, recently, I've gotten into Padel, which is somewhat of a newer sport, but I've been playing a bunch around New York. So uh, I think that's a high level of who I am. Uh, but again, super excited to be here. Is it really pronounced Padel over Paddle? It is because it actually derives from Mexico. So it's Padel. Del. Okay. I've seen some videos of Padel. And man, it looks like the perfect blend of like you get pickleball, squash, and racquetball. I don't know if you ever made it to the racquetball courts at the gym at Maryland, but Sam and I used to play all the time. And that is like the best workout and most entertaining game I think I want to play more of. So, but Padel looks pretty good. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, I I, I would say current, but. Definitely a former tennis player, uh, played competitively and uh, started when I was eight years old. And I played competitively all the way through middle school and high school as well. And then I used to teach actually outside of uh, kind of like first job, I, I guess you could call out while I was at University of Maryland as well. Uh, but with that being said, I know freshman year when I was living over in Cumberland, I definitely spent some time playing squash and racquetball as well. And this is according to, to Wikipedia. So like take it at you know, as you will, but the sport, Padel, you talked about a combination of racquetball, squash, tennis. Uh, It actually was created, I believe, in like the 1970s by a very rich Mexican man that couldn't fit a tennis court in his backyard. So he basically built a smaller tennis court with the intention of combining tennis as well as racquetball and squash so that's how the sport was created we love some innovative new sports i mean there you go i played uh some more traditional sports growing up but as i've gotten older and less athletic and more sore i've had to resort to some less traditional sports so you're calling tennis not traditional sam i'm calling padel not traditional parker okay Okay? all right don't get it twisted yeah i was gonna say (laughs) Yeah, so, yeah. Zach, and working at, at LinkedIn, right? I think when we were growing up, you heard about all these cool companies that you wanted to work at. And it was a lot of, I think as a young high school and college kid, the companies that we saw in front of our eyes. Chipotle, working in corporate there. LinkedIn being one of them, these kind of newer techie type companies started blowing up, I would say, when we were in college. You now are working at LinkedIn, an incredible place that pretty much everybody knows about. How has that journey kind of shaped you in your thinking around joining this this tech world? Because you're in it now, man. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, look, we have we have around 45 minutes together. Uh, I think we, we dived headfirst right into it, right? But uh, no time to waste by any means. But I, I, I say that to say that uh, grew up in a, a single parent household. Um, you know, I, I feel like I was taught at a young age, you know, education will be the li- liaison as well as the channel, as well as the journey to like, get a good job and uh, make good money and, you know, put this all behind us essentially and be able to provide for my family one day. Right. Um, and, you know, I think it's flooring different opportunities come through like different experiences, typically through extracurricular activities, whether it's in middle school or whether it's in high school. Right. And it's crazy to even think back to like, ref- or I should say reference back to something like middle school, but like those experiences matter because they are kind of like what set you up for that next level, which is high school and, uh, and beyond. But with that being said, I mean, when I, got to University of Maryland. I wasn't in the business school. I was a part of Freshman Connection, which uh, I don't know like the technicalities of Freshman Connection by any means. All I know, and I'm sure a lot of people listening to this that also went to Maryland will say, yeah, we took classes at night, right? And it was a little bit of a uh, a challenge, uh, took a little bit extra work to get into the schools such as like Smith, right? Which is a business school. But with that being said, I mean, I was just focused on, hey, like, what extracurriculars can I involve myself in to explore and get exposure to things that I potentially want to do, whether it was like being a TA for the introduction to entrepreneurship class, or it was the Hinman CEOs living and learning program where you were exposed to kind of the, what it looked like to build a startup or what it looked like to build a technology company, for lack of a better term. Um, and what came along with that was, I was a part of a professional development program for diverse professionals called Management Leadership for Tomorrow. And from that, it gave me exposure to a couple different opportunities. And from that specifically, I actually was able to intern at PNC Bank, sophomore going to my junior year. This is, I probably got into the business school around the same time that I got that internship with PNC because you know, I thought I was going to go the finance track. I thought I was going into investment banking. So I was like, I just wanted to do something, right? And I had the luxury of having an older brother that's 15 months older than me. So with that being said, he was a year ahead of me. He was a mechanical engineer at Maryland. Uh, when he got his first internship junior year, I was a sophomore. And I was like, I want an internship too, right? Uh, so with that being said, the only real offer I got was PNC Bank. And it was in Cleveland, Ohio. And I remember calling my mom and being like, hey, mom, I, the recruiter from PNC actually just called me and I need to interview in Cleveland next week. What should I do? She was like, what do you mean? What should you do? <laughs> you're going to you're going to Cleveland. Right. So I jumped on a plane. I was probably like 18, uh, 19 years old. Interview with PNC Bank. Long story short, got the offer. Uh, spent the summer in Cleveland. I definitely call it my uh, my character building summer. Uh, I wasn't old enough to drink. I wasn't old enough to like go to the bars by any Not means. Drinking so. in Cleveland is hard and no shitting <laughs> on Cleveland. Been there. I'm a Midwestern boy. Cleveland yep. revolves a little bit around drinking to have fun. Yeah. Yeah. Drinking it's- and bad football. And that's probably Parker's where talking, the drinking comes smack up. Right. I'm, I'm talking smack. You have to throw <laughs> that right. in there. Just saying. I'm a, I'm a Ravens guy, so I'll, I'll let it fly for now. But uh, I say that to say that I got that exposure to the banking finance life and I used that internship as what I thought was going to be the stepping stone into the investment banking route. So when I got back to Maryland for my junior year, you know, around that that fall time, I was uh, going into interviews and I was traveling to New York and doing all these super days. I was getting absolutely cooked. I'm not going to lie to you. Like I was, I was sitting across from these people and, you know, I I still showed up and I feel like I was competitive. Uh, But I just don't think finance like was particularly my passion at the time. Um, even one person mid interview, I'm sure he was an MD at, at a bold bracket bank that will go unnamed was just like, Zach, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> like, are you, is this for you? And, you know, I don't know if it was, and it, I don't think it was really at the time, you know, and I kind of bring it back full circle because it, it allowed me to do introspection and just have a better understanding of like, Zach, like, who are you? What, uh, what do you care about? Right. And I would say it's, elevating others to realize their full potential. And as I started to explore different opportunities, internship opportunities for my junior going into senior year, I came across LinkedIn, 
right? And their vision is to create economic opportunity for every member of the global workforce. And I'm like, that economic opportunity phrase is incredibly interesting because as I kind of referred to earlier, I felt like, you know, I faced challenges as far as uh, a couple of setbacks uh, financially growing up in a single parent household. So I always felt that, or when I heard that economic opportunity phrase, I was like, wow, I truly feel as if my mom actually sacrificed our economic stability for my family, as well as my brother and I's economic opportunity. So with that being said, I think it tells the full story of uh, taking my upbringing, identifying my passions, identifying what I truly care about, again, elevating others. Um, and additionally, like what I was good at, right? And, and what I wanted to do, and that's be around people, that's elevate people. Um, and I was able to do that through a sales role, um, selling the technology that provides access to people at the end of the day. What a way to put it all into a nice five minute story. I really appreciate that, Zach. And I know there was a, probably a lot more that went along the way. And we'll get a little bit more into that as well, because I know you weren't always at LinkedIn post-college, but there you hit on something really that hits home with Sam and I, and it's the piece on introspection. And you go through those interviews and you might've gotten feedback that at the time might've felt a bit negative. But when you look back at it, it could be the most positive feedback that you've ever gotten. It's like, is Zach, is this really for you? And you were able to go back home and you mentioned, have some introspection about where you wanted to go. Think deeper about yourself. And Sam and I are on a mission to help young people think deeper about their lives so that they know who they are, what they want, and what inspires them so that they can elevate themselves to go conquer the real world. So how do you do it? How, like, what does introspection look like to you? Because we found that it can look like very different to many people. Yeah, um, that's an awesome question. That's an awesome question. And to your point, I think introspection is very personal. Um, obviously, it starts with you while at the same time. And like, I think this answer can be interpreted in a couple different ways. Like for me personally, I might look at introspection as, hey, like, where do I feel like I am right now? But I'm also an extrovert. Like I get my energy from being around other people, uh, whether that's my friends from work, whether that's my uh, friends in New York, whether that's my boys from home, um, you know, whether that's my girlfriend, right? Like, and I do the introspection, I think by how I show up, right? How do I show up in, in those environments? Like, where are we in life, right? Like, how do I feel about work? How do I feel about friends here? How do I feel about myself in those settings? So with that being considered, I think I do the introspection basing it on kind of the structure around me. Um, and I've been so fortunate to have such good people around me and consistent people around me for such a long time that um, I think I kind of look for structure to be able to do that introspection, right? So you take all, you take all these inputs, right? And then what is the activity itself that you do to take all that information to then look at a piece of paper, if it is a piece of paper, and say, I'm taking that step forward now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, this might, uh, it might sound ironic, but I think it's just like my line of thinking work for, working for a company like LinkedIn, where I called out that I support businesses with their hiring strategy, but additionally, their upskilling and skills strategy altogether. Uh, so I think the introspection that I do typically is professional from a stamp, uh, and I, would say that just because there has been a little bit change of my profession over the past two years. And I can give you an example of when we'll probably get into it as well. And anyone can look this up on my LinkedIn profile. I was at LinkedIn for around four or five years. And then I actually left to go to a startup and then I boomerang back to LinkedIn. And I feel as if part of the reason that I left the company is because I was on such an accelerated trajectory here, which I can't thank LinkedIn enough. While at the same time, I wanted to see kind of the outside world. I wanted to gain new skills, right? And I kind of did that introspection of sitting down, writing down on a piece of paper. Hey, like what skills do I feel like I have right now? 
uh, what am I missing? And then I started to kind of fill in the gaps on, hey, what roles are out there to help me fill these gaps, right? And with that being considered, like that's ultimately the the opportunity I left to go to as the opportunity that I felt like would kind of expand those skills, expand that exposure, uh, challenge me in a certain way in how I wanted to be challenged based on where I was. And again, I'm sure we'll get into it. But the cool part is, is I can definitely sit in front of you and say, hey, like I made the right decision. I expanded myself. That introspection that I did prior to making the move to go into a startup like Multiverse uh, uh, was was fair, was fair. And I think, you know, growth is uncomfortable and I, I definitely got uncomfortable. Uh, and now I can sit here and um, kind of look introspectively again and say, like, I'm in a awesome place and I got the skills that I was looking for. I want to give credit, I think, to your mom here, Zach, on making introspection be not just okay, but probably encouraged growing up as two young men ourselves, right? One of the goals Parker and I have for this podcast is we have a lot of young guys that listen to this. And many of them, I think, in modern society, whether it's the TikTok era, the gamer era, the sports, the macho man era, that reflecting and, and realizing maybe you're not perfect, maybe you're unhappy, maybe you have struggles, whatever it may be, we kind of push that down. And I think one of the goals that Parker and I have, and I'm so grateful that you just opened up and shared your journey of introspection is saying, not only is it okay, it's needed, it's encouraged, it's important. It's just as if not more important than going to the gym every day and mm -hmm. taking time to realize who you are at your core, what you want, what your vision is, and what truly fuels you and drives you, I think is one of the most important skills that young people around the globe don't have enough of. So I appreciate you opening up and sharing that with us. Yeah. And if I could add something to that, I think, you know, you, your question was like, what do you do? What are your actions? Right. And I kind of like told the story. I think something that I would say as far as to answer the question, like, how do you think about it or how do you do it? So more tactical, I would say latch on to structure, whether that structure is something like the gym right? That's a daily consistent routine. Why are you going to the gym? I'm going to the gym because, you know, I'm competitive. Oh, but additionally, it makes me feel good, right? And you can kind of break it down uh, to whatever characteristics that might be. And again, it doesn't have to be that gym analogy. It could be, oh, I like to hang out with my friends. Why do I like to hang out with my friends? What do I like to do with my friends, right? Oh, I like to go to the park with them. Oh, why do I like to go to the park? Oh, because I like to have a clear mind and I like to have genuine conversation, right? So you can, I, I think the opportunity to do introspection is identifying that structure and then break it down on the, uh, excuse me, like reverse engineer it to the very core characteristics of who you are and then being able to flip that, whether it is showing up in your social or personal life or flipping those characteristics slash skills into your professional life. The structure is so important, I feel like, in building what we call mental fortitude and understanding how we navigate the hard things in life and the easy and good things in life, right? The hard things sometimes lead to good things or most of the time they lead to good things. But the structure is the thing that you can lean on um, when times get hard and also when times get easy too, because when times get easy, you might become a little bit more loose in how you go about your day. So I love that. I think it's an incredible point. I can imagine when you left LinkedIn to go to multiverse, you had to rethink your structure in your life because you were navigating a whole new world. So let's talk about your experience at multiverse. And we know we, you boomerang back. How was the experience? And tell us why you eventually came back to LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'd feel free to jump in uh, here and ask questions along the way. As you called out, we're, we're here shooting the shit. Would love the, the dialogue. But, um, you know, I think, you know, that uh, when uh, uh, Shy is in that interview and, uh, the reporter is just like with all the Thunder teammates behind him. And he's just like, shy, how do you do it? He's like, well, uh, my whole life is consistent. 
right? Like, and I called it out because I swear the journey from LinkedIn to multiverse back to LinkedIn is very consistent. And where I was when I left LinkedIn, I was an account executive within our search and staffing line of business at LinkedIn. Um, so what that means is working with uh, essentially third party hand hunters from their business development strategy, but uh, additionally, their recruiting strategy as well. And then I called out that program management leadership for tomorrow that I was in, which was a professional development program for highly competitive black Latinx and Native American men and women across the country, uh, collegiate students more specifically. And then on top of that, very passionate about elevating diverse talent and multiverse had this mission of essentially elevating diverse talent through uh, let's call it from a high level scaling professional apprenticeships to the United States. So London based, but essentially we're scaling to the United States. So the reason I call it the consistency was number one, I'm a diverse professional. Number two, I credit my uh, experiences at management leadership for tomorrow in college that really upskilled me and provided the exposure to companies such as LinkedIn, companies such as, as PNC, as well as the peers in the community around me. I would not be the professional I am today without that program. And then on top of that, I had that experience from a business perspective of, I know how the bottom line can be impacted based on, their human, based on a human capital strategy, based on putting butts in seats, which is the search and staffing element. So that's when, and then additionally, I was in a mid-market capacity and now I'm multiverse. I was going over to an enterprise role, work, working with Fortune 50, working with Fortune 100 companies, working with their C-suite to essentially align their people's strategy to achieve business objectives. And while I was there, I mean, they have heavy hitting leaders across the board. Um, more specifically the sales leaders. And I was looking to learn, right? Like that's, as I called out earlier, like I was looking to gain skills and I know that they were a medic heavy, which is a sales methodology. They were a medic heavy uh, company. So in between my two weeks, leaving LinkedIn and joining Multiverse, I actually bought the medic sales methodology book. And I was like, oh, I could either read this in New York or I could go read this somewhere else. So I actually did a solo trip to Puerto Rico. My first solo trip, I was like, let me do somewhere that's like, quote unquote, like low risk. They speak English. It's still US territory. I'm not too far off the beaten path. So I went to Puerto Rico by myself. And I funny part is, again, being an extrovert, I landed there on like, a Sunday there till Wednesday. And I was like, I landed there. I'm like, why the hell am I here? <laughs> I was so lonely. But eventually came around, read the book, and that book changed my career. Like it changed my sales career, but it changed my career because it added that structure, right? Because I was walking into this room, uh, see, and it's all coming back around, right? But I was essentially walking into this role where there wasn't much structure. You could look at it from the company perspective. It's a startup, right? And I knew what I was walking into as well. So I knew that, when I was stepping into a new quote unquote world from a sales perspective, and I was working with a lot of uh, different stakeholders and um, significantly heavier hitters. And what I mean by that is like the, the leadership, but additionally, the clients that I was working with, how I even had to approach my sales process, going from working with search and staffing firms that could have been anywhere from one person to a hundred people to working with C-suite that manages 85,000 people, right? So I knew that if I was going to essentially succeed in itself, I needed to almost like build that road for myself. And that road was through skills, which is why I read that book. Right. And those skills were also aligned to what their methodology was. I'll pause. Zach, I think it's, I, yeah, I think it's today. interesting, right. Talking about you trying to upskill yourself and realizing you had a gap in knowledge, you wanted to learn something new. And the reason why I find that interesting is I have a lot of, you know, younger professionals that are just starting out in consulting that come to me and say, Sam, what should I do in my summer before I start my job? And I remember what I did, which was everyone told me that coding was the thing I needed to know to be successful. So I tried to teach myself code on Code Academy and failed and couldn't and did my best, but like wasn't into it. 
And so when people come to me now and say, what should I do before starting at EY? What should I do before starting in consulting? I say, go enjoy your summer and figure out who you are. And I think that advice, I only say to the new people starting out because you already had that introspection phase. You had that skill already. So you knew what you wanted. You were ready for a new chapter and you needed to upskill something specific. So I think for a lot of the younger people out there that are hearing that and have probably heard me say my advice before of, don't worry, you'll learn it on the job. You'll learn the skills. Don't stress. There are different stages where I think you have to take a different approach. Zach already had that introspective muscle. He already had that skill. He needed a new skill that truly changed his career. And I think I want to just point out that difference um, because I am sometimes a little hard on people that are like, I have to learn something new. I have to, this is a new role. I got to grow. I got to take my time off and vacation to, to really gain something insightful when they haven't mastered themselves yet. So I think that's a, a big thing that I wanted to call out. Yeah, I think that's a great call out. And I think it, uh, you know, it truly depends on where you are in your career and where you are in your life, right? Like sometimes we do need to just take a second and to breathe, right? Because uh, for whatever reason, maybe we're going through a challenge. I mean, I'm in sales, right? Like maybe I'm going through a slump and I just need to t take a week off and I need to go get my mind right and see that there's life out there outside of sales, right? And outside of LinkedIn as an example. But uh, for this specific example, I knew that I was walking into a, let's just call it a hectic environment in terms of uh, working for the first time in a startup capacity. And I knew I needed something to latch onto, especially with the, the as I called out earlier, the stakeholders and um, the, the uh, I don't want to say clients by any means, but like the, the potential clients that I was working with and the people that I was selling into. And I also knew that I was a younger professional. So I need to know, I need them to know that I know my stuff, right? And I did that through upskilling myself. Um, so to kind of like call out that experience, I, I would say that was a long winded way, but I think impactful way to say, I created that structure through upskilling myself. And then once I was there, you know, I'm going into training sessions and, and uh, they are also onboarding as well as upskilling me. But because I did the legwork, I was almost, and it's funny because this, uh, the company itself had, essentially was providing an applied learning model, right? Where it was this kind of earn where you learn concept and uh, on the job training for lack of a better term, but I am a product of that while I was also selling it because I upskilled myself before I even got there. I got there and I'm being taught from incredibly smart professionals that are taking what I read and putting it to practice and offering real life examples. And then I'm able to go essentially practice it. Right. So, uh, you know, I think it's doing the legwork and being able to provide that structure. Uh, but as far as the overall experience itself, like I, it, it came very natural to me because of what I was saying earlier and around the consistency of why I was passionate about this company, right? From a sales perspective, from elevating diverse professionals perspective, uh, and also just understanding, I guess, people strategies aligning to business objectives. Uh, and it was a very fast paced environment, you know, it was, it started on a Monday, book a business on a Thursday, uh, working with some very reputable brands as well. And I think my approach to it was like, all right, let's dive into it. Let's fail fast uh, and let's give it all we got. Um, and I'm a very collaborative person, I'd, I'd say. So I was definitely leaning on my teammates that were there for a little bit longer than I was to, or to get me up to speed. Um, and I had a really good experience there overall. Like, I feel like it grew me into the professional that I am today. It absolutely upskilled me from a sales perspective. I've never felt more confident in my sales capabilities. But additionally, I think that when you go to a startup and you're not protected by the brand of LinkedIn, you also see what the real world out there really is. And I think it grew me up as a man as well. So I'm uh, more than appreciative of my experience there. And uh, I will say a lot of the skills that I learned there, I've been able to bring back to LinkedIn and do incredibly well over here. So I'm going through your uh, your LinkedIn right now, and I see a ton of experiences. Zach, I know you crushed it in school. I know that you had... Still do that. Really, I mean, 
<laughs> I, I, I would assume you crushed it if you were a freshman yeah. connection and found your way in the business school. You had good internships, right? You highlight some incredible accomplishments at LinkedIn. And I look, and I'm going to be straight up with you. And I look at Multiverse. It says April 2023 to November 2023. I know you went there knowing you would be there longer than seven months. So what questions did you have to ask yourself when you looked in the mirror, maybe it was in October or November when you left, that you needed to make a change? Was I'm sorry, was it, are you asking the change from LinkedIn to Multiverse or Multiverse? Multiverse back to LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it, it came back to what I was looking for. Um, I think that before I even left LinkedIn, I highlighted kind of like what I cared about, what I was looking for. Um, what I kind of wanted in that next career journey and multiverse is a mission based startup. So I felt compelled to, to uh, I guess, pursue that opportunity because that's something that I, I wanted. Um, you know, and I think from the introspection that I had to do transitioning out of, out of uh, the, the startup environment is, and this goes for every single startup, right? Like stability is not, it can be not as clear uh, at, rather than at a larger company, right? And uh, I felt like where we were going economically, the macro environment, I also have a role to my family. I have a role outside of my uh, professional life. So with that i would say the one of the main drivers of that was stability right and i think to make that decision you have to ask yourself like what do you care about zach the professional what does zach the you know young adult living in new york care about uh, how do you want to spend your time? I think that's probably the most imp uh, important question. How do you want to spend your time from a professional standpoint as well as a personal standpoint? Uh, and then that's identifying the what. And then it's like, all right, what do we need to do? Where do I need to lock in? And then when I do that, what do, what will that yield? But additionally, it's. I think these are all holistic thoughts. Like I don't. I can't necessarily pinpoint one to the nets to the nets. Um, because that's ultimately who we are at the end of the day, but being able to at least identify and pinpoint these solicited thoughts, such as what do I want to do in my uh, professional life during my work time? What do I want to do in my free time with my friends? Well, how do I uh, want to show up for my family? And then also asking yourself, like, how do I need to do this? Right. Like, how do I need to do my professional life? How do I need to spend my professional time? Which like, you don't need to spend your time, one way or another, but like, if you have big goals, like I do, I want to be a C-suite, you know, down the road, um, whether that's CEO of 10,000, 20,000 person firm or chief people officer aligning these people's strategies to business objectives. I knew in that moment, not necessarily in that moment, I shouldn't say it like that. That makes it sound so dramatic, but I think as I was considering like what I wanted and what I needed to do, I was like, this is something I got what I need. I got those skills. And like, let me go back and put these to practice and see the fruits of my labor. Because if I make this next move right now and I'm able to accomplish these results, my next next move, which could be six months down the road, which I'm around eight months, nine months back to LinkedIn. And I would say that like I made the right decision uh, because I'm seeing the results, but my next 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 move, which could be five to 10 years down the road. I believe that it was the right move for me because of that introspection. But again, it has to be intuition on top of the introspection. So, uh, again, kind of like what you want, what you need, look at yourself holistically, uh, and like, where do you need to show up and lock in? Obviously, Zach, a lot of different factors came into play with all these decisions, right? And I think you took in the information that you had, synthesized them, were introspective, and then made the best decision for you. And a, a highlight I want to share with our Elevation Nation listeners out there, many of them are concerned 
the first job, the first internship, you know, you get that internship sophomore, junior year, you're trying to get the return offer. Then you're like, Oh, that's my first job. I can't leave that. You know, it looks bad on a resume if I leave too quickly. So now I have another couple of years here and I'm miserable, right? Like these are the scenarios that literally people DM us and write in and ask for advice on. And I think Zach, you are walking and living proof that no one's going to have a perfect cat path. You need to trust your gut at the end of the day, make decisions that feel right to you that are best for your situation. And I think for our generation who grew up with our parents' generation that was extremely loyal to their employer, right? Like many of our parents worked the same job for 40, 50 years and climbed their way up that same corporate ladder. And I think those messages were kind of passed down to many of us and instilled within us, but that's not how our generation thinks or works. So I think for all the young people that are just getting their first internships or jobs, maybe aren't loving it off the jump. First off, that's normal. But second off, you don't have to stay there. You don't always have to be somewhere. Sometimes there are other opportunities. Sometimes you need a couple months to be introspective. Sometimes you want to go back to school or switch your, your total profession on its head, right? Like there's not one clear, perfect path for everybody. And I think, Zach, you are certainly proof that being introspective, using mental fortitude, and taking some time for yourself to make some hard decisions will certainly be fruitful in the long run. Yeah, yeah. And if I could add to that as well, and uh, I got to credit my girlfriend for kind of like having this perspective, right? But it's not only thinking, like it's not only doing introspection and uh, saying, I think this of myself, but it's also like a feeling as well, right? Like she'll communicate, you know, we're, we're working our, on our communication. We're be, being very intentional about how we communicate, right? And, uh, you know, she might feel a certain way, but I might use logic and, and think like it, it should be this way, right? So when I say that, what I'm referring to is essentially for the introspection, being tactical around it, breaking it down, whether it is like the thought process, meaning into specific characteristics uh, or skills, right? But also breaking the feeling down right? Like I feel X when I do Y, right? And then being able to essentially identify those, whether it looks like writing it down, I have these skills, I have these feelings, and then whatever that, you know, word bubble is, whatever you want to call it, uh, being able to, again, reverse engineer it, and now identify uh, where can I take these strong suits of mine, uh, and go, right? Whether that's a role, whether that's socially, whether that's introspectively all together. It's so fun to hear other, like like Sam, it's so cool to hear other people's like ways that they practice introspection. Like Zach, we've had people who've come on and said the way they're introspective is sit for 20 minutes and try to think about literally nothing. Avoiding, right? thoughts. And then as a result of that, they're able to come to terms with a certain thing or thought that comes to mind. Whereas for you, it seems very calculated. You're very intentional <laughs> about the things that you think about. You're like, oh, this happened. This made me feel this way. And as a result of that, I'm going to go there. It's amazing. It's great. And it's helped you get to where you are today. It's helped you have an amazing experiences at the University of Maryland, in Cleveland, Ohio, starting out at LinkedIn, over to Multiverse, back at LinkedIn, and now you're continuing to elevate because you're exercising that mental fortitude muscle. And that's going to help you as you continue to go through the inevitable bad times and the inevitable, hopefully, good times as well. So, Zach been an amazing conversation let's go to the next section rapid fire we got some questions for you first thing off the dome tell us what you think uh hopefully these are pretty easy you ready for it <laughs> i don't know we'll see <laughs> all right let's do it what gets you fired up every day working with really smart people all right um one that i have around linkedin and, and upskilling a world that you're in what is one skill and please don't say coding because i can't teach myself that i tried that you think a lot of young people should start to work on? Oh, rapid fire on this one? <laughs> yeah, I rapid mean, fire. I think storytelling, mm. question asking, uh, and acumen slash 
authenticity, authenticity in your acumen. You can plug LinkedIn learning if you need to here. You're more than welcome. <laughs> bye. Bye. There you go. Call me. Yeah, there you Call, go. me. <laughs> Call me. <laughs> you know, I think I think storytelling. That's a, that's such a good one. So it's something that I feel like you never get like become an expert at. You always have to adjust it because audience like people are all different and they take in information completely differently. And the act of storytelling is understanding your audience. And then you want to learn storytelling. Start a podcast and have people not like Zach. But some people who don't know how to tell stories, come on, and you have to get them to tell a story. That's storytelling one on one. Are you are you patting yeah. yourself on the back right now, Sam? Is that what you're telling? Yeah, yeah. That, yeah I'm okay, giving us okay, kudos. Fine. We've learned. All right. I'll get, All right. And I'll, I'll give you I'll give you a reason why of storytelling just real quick because I worked such on the front lines of it, and I see kind of like the how roles are changing right in front of my eyes. Uh, AI is here. It's not going anywhere. People need to lean into it. Obviously, like the responsible, right? We can all forget the political BS of it, right? Like be responsible with it, all that good stuff, right? But like, you need to know how to storytell because kind of those take coding, for example, right? Like the AI is going to play an element and do it quicker, right? So we need to be able to at least like prompt it, train it, right? And that's where your creativity comes in, in leveraging that AI to help you do things quicker. And then additionally, we need to, whether you're working with the entire organization of LinkedIn, right? Like this wrote my speech, but my own IP is going to uh, deliver it, right? So that's where like the authenticity, uh, authenticity as well as the acumen comes in. But I need to be able to connect with people, right? I need to connect with people because AI can't do that, right? I need to be able to, uh, again, I guess like, again, I want to say storytell, but uh, I want to be able to communicate how it's going to impact, yeah. right? And It's human to human uh, communication and storytelling is a way you can drive your points home in a way that resonates with humans with emotion and a soul. There you go. There you go. I was kind of getting lost a little bit, but you pulled me right back in. Hey, and storytelling, I, we're a team. It's a team exactly. story right here. Hey, exactly. team storytelling is is fun. Story. Sam and I, yeah. we we've, we've got we've worked on our craft, and it, it's fun when you get to storytell with another person, Zach, because it yep. makes it that much more compelling. Absolutely, absolutely, and uh, I think another part of it is it's AI is making a things a lot harder to BS, right? And I'm not saying like anyone that listens to this does that by any means, but you have to be on your game and you have to be credible and you have to be legitimate, right? So you got to bring your experiences to life from a human perspective. So I think that's how I tie it all together. Hell yeah. All right, Zach, couple more questions for you. Last rapid fire, and then we'll move to our final question of the day. What's a book recommendation that you have for Elevation Nation? See, now you're going to make me say this. I'm not a crazy sales guy by any means, but I got to say medic because, it, yes, it's a sales methodology, but I do believe that it can teach you business perspective. I think it teaches you acumen. acumen um, and just how to approach different business uh, challenges. And it aligns like a framework and thought process to it. Uh, I will call out. I'm not like a huge. I'm not. I'm not a big reader by any means. Uh, and then I'm not like a. I don't want to call it self help, but I don't read too many of those books, so I can't offer that perspective. But a book that changed my life and my profession would be the medic book. Here we go. I love it. All right. Zach, our last and most important question, every single member of Elevation Nation, whether you've come on the podcast and enjoyed us officially, or if we've spoken to your high school, your camp, your college, or your company, every single person that's now part of our movement has what we call a mental motto. That's a phrase that embodies who you are and how you live. So Zach Joyner, what is your mental motto? Uh, I would say mine is, and I got this from my mom. I've talked about this in the past, but it's what's for you is for you, right? Like if something doesn't work out your way, Parker, Sam, as we talked about, like 
Maybe it looks like doing that introspection, but maybe it's just not for you, right? I started off with the story of going through a number of interviews because I thought I was going to the investment banking track, uh, which, yeah, didn't, didn't work out, right? But it wasn't for me. And I would not be sitting here talking to either of you if that particular moment in time did not happen. Um, so, you know, we might work ourselves up over some things. We might get excited and may not get something, uh, whether it's a job, whether uh, it's a promotion, whether it's, uh, you know, something outside of work as well. But at the same time, I would say do that introspection, which was the consistency around our conversation uh, or a consistent theme around our conversation. Um, and just know that, you know, how can you either change paths or stay the course, which I believe what's for you is for you means. Accepting the reality of the situation, taking that information, getting real with yourself and saying, okay, this is what it is. How do I put a step forward now? I love that. Yeah. It's a great Damn mental straight. model. Damn but Zach comes to an end of a nice 46 minute long conversation. Uh, I was really, really happy with how this conversation went. I'm excited about welcoming you to Elevation Nation. And Sam and I always love to say we love rooting on our elevators from the sidelines to see you continue to exercise mental fortitude and elevate yourself, not just in work, but in life, because there's a lot of good things coming for you, both in work and life. And um, we can't wait to watch you continue to elevate. So thank you, brother. Let's go. Thank you, fellas, for having me. Let's do it again sometime. Well done, Zach. You crush it, man.